Hi, my name is Heather Blanchard, and I'm a volunteer. But I might not be your average volunteer. I'm what you would call a digital humanitarian. Each and every day, there are disasters all across the world. It could be a tornado, a flood, or a fire. But when these events happen, people want to help. They no longer want to just to give and donate. They want to donate themselves. We're part of a new share society where people, it's not just about sharing something on Facebook. They want to share their skills, their resources, their connectivity to their social structures. Today, this is evident by volunteers wanting to participate. Take Jacques, for example. He, he just says, I just can't sit there and watch CNN. I can't look at the internet. I must do something. I really want to do something. And Josh, who's a, a computer programmer, and he's like, isn't this a nice thing to be able to share my skill to, to help uh, people that may be in need? The thing about Josh and Jacques is they may never know what it's like to be a first responder. They may never be on a plane and be deployed to the field. But does that make their contribution um, any less? Can they be part of, of a greater global response? My argument is yes, they can. Part of the challenge today is that digital humanitarians are not necessarily as connected to the official response systems. And my wish is for that to change. Because often, digital humanitarians, when they're offering themselves and when they want to help use their skills, they're, they're met with this. So I'm here today to talk, to tell you a story about, digital, about a digital humanitarian community called Crisis Commons. And I want, to, I want to share with you first that there's so many great digital humanitarian communities out there that are doing great things every day all around the world. But I'm going to tell you one story about the community that I volunteer for. And our community really started with an idea. How can we bring together first responders, like your local fire department and police departments and public health, with the technology community, with international humanitarian relief communities, at the local level. How can we just, you know, start that engagement? And that was really where Crisis Camp was born. It was really all about creating the relationships before the disaster, being able to, to make those connections. During the Haiti earthquake, people began to create crisis camps all over the world. It was truly amazing. Crisis Camp transformed from not just a, dial a place for dialogue and information exchange, but it transformed itself into a place of action. And there were 65 crisis camps in 10 different countries with about 2,500 people participating. It was truly amazing. This community today still contributes. Let me show you a few examples. During the New Zealand earthquake, uh, crisis camp communities rallied support, and they wanted to support the local technology community in Christchurch, and they helped them with their recovery map. Also, during the blizzards that happened in North America this year, uh, the local crisis camp community in Chicago worked with and partnered with Humanity Road, the Chicago CERT, and the Chicago Tribune for their map. During the Japan earthquake, crisis camp volunteers worked in a virtual sense. We, people were, were dialing in through Skype all over the world. And part of what we did is we partnered with GIS Corps to look at different ways to use data sets. And I'm happy to say, for the very first time, Crisis Commons during the Japan earthquake partnered with the United Nations. And the United Nations asked us to ask the volunteers to go out and search for open data sets that might be helpful uh, for their operations. But I would have to say that these are all these great things that digital humanitarian communities can do, including Crisis Commons during the disaster. There are so many more. But part of the challenge is, is that we need to be working before the crisis. We truly need to, we need to have those relationships made before the event. And I'm going to tell you a story about missing persons information and a volunteer named Tim Schwartz. During the Haiti earthquake, Tim Schwartz found himself in the middle of coordinating missing persons information. And during that, during that, um, during that process, 
he, he said, you know, can we really do this better? Is there, are there other people that are doing this? How can we connect this? Because during disaster events, missing persons databases just pop up every place. And what ended up happening, he started a few conference calls. Mind you, Tim Schwartz is an artist in his day job. That's what he does during the day. He started a few conference calls. And then those conference calls turned into a written framework. And now today, all of these organizations are working in an informal way through a community of interest to start looking at different ways for missing persons information to be interoperable, ways to innovate. Today, I just want to leave you with the idea that there are digital humanitarians all around the world. They're people like you and me. They're people that may not ever be a first responder, but they have skills and they have all kinds of ideas. And they can work not only during the, res during the response to support first responders, to support international humanitarian relief organizations, but what they can also do is they can work before the crisis when I would say it really matters when you build those relationships, especially at the local level. So my wish here is, is that we connect the digital humanitarian communities with official response systems. And so if we do that, we're, a, we're really able to have a true global united response. Thank you very much.